Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amy Julian. I'm the director for the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support at Illinois State University. I'd like to welcome you to our third webinar in our UDL series brought to you by CAST. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about universal design for learning in practice, supporting virtual learning. Just a little note, this series is brought to you by the Illinois State Board of Education and through the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support. All of the attendees are currently in listen-only mode. If you have um, a question, please post that in the question box and we will happily address those questions. And then if you um, would like to, and if we do have time, we will field some questions that way or you can um, raise your hand and we'll unmute you if you'd like to discuss. Again, um, the bit.ly for this is in the chat pane there so you can see the presentation and there are handouts in the handouts box so be sure you check those out as well with that i'm going to go ahead and hand the floor over to melissa to get us started so thank you all so very much for joining us and melissa hello welcome back to those of you that have come back and um welcome to those that are new to this this particular webinar, we'll go over the webinar series and where you can find the recordings and everything in a second. Um, but first I wanted to get a set up for, for today. And if you want a copy of the slides, you can use that bit.ly that is on the screen. It's bit.ly backslash cast, and cast is in all caps, and then lowercase UDL, and then capital IL for Illinois, and then three, because this is our third webinar. So I think that it was also sent out in the chat. Um, so you can also go there to get the bit.ly. But with that bit.ly, you can um, follow along with us in the slides. So again, my name is Melissa Sanjay and I am an implementation specialist at CAST. And I work with schools in New Hampshire and across the country working to help them implement UDL in their classrooms, in their districts, and in their school buildings. So I work with teachers, district leaders, and school leaders in that capacity. Prior to that, I worked in alternative ed and in the school that I um, led, we had career explorations and CTE for credit. So I'm happy to be here with uh, you all. And I'm gonna hand it over to Sam to have Sam introduce herself. Hi everybody, thank you for being here today and I'm glad to be with you. Um, my name is Sam Johnston and I direct our post-secondary and workforce development efforts at CAST that has us working um, with higher education institutions, with workforce development agencies and with um, K-12 CT schools and others uh, to think about uh, preparing the uh, talent pipeline uh, broadly and making sure that all uh, young people have equitable access to um, good career opportunities. Um, and we see UDL as sort of central to making that happen for everyone. Talk about that more today. And my background, um, actually quite a lot of my background is in workforce development in a blended format or uh, fully online across a, a number of um, different, different fields. Um, so I'm very glad to be talking about this with you today and hope that even though this, you know, experience of COVID-19 is really, really challenging for all of us, that we'll also be able to see some of the, the sides of being able to engage with people um, remotely and online that are also opportunities for doing some things differently. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Melissa. Um, I'm Amanda Bastoni and I'm so excited to be here again with you for a third webinar series. And my background is really career and technical education. I was a CTE teacher and then a CTE director. Um, and now I have the wonderful opportunity to work with CAST. And I'm super excited to have Sam here too to help us talk about virtual, using UDL in the virtual world. Great, so as we get started, we wanted to sort of prime your thinking around these things. And if you want to answer in the question box, uh, what strategies have you used to help your students transition from um, a physical classroom environment to a remote learning environment during this um, COVID-19 pandemic? And what barriers have you seen your students encounter? So you can answer all of these questions or one of these questions or, or none of these questions, but you can either answer them in the chat box, you can write on a sticky at your desk, or you can just kind of hold it in mind. Uh, but the second question is, what barriers did your students encounter when they were making that transition? And then the third question 
is how did you keep open doors of communication during this transition to remote learning? How did you find ways when you were not physically present to be present for your students? So those are some questions that sort of prime your thinking as we, we go through uh, this webinar. We want to remind you of um, our learning environment that we, um, we normally would do this in a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting where we'd say, stand up, walk, stand in the back of the room, take somebody out and talk to them. Um, so we want you to know in terms of your options for self-regulation, you're at your house, so you stand anywhere, sit anywhere, walk around, eat, fidget, anything that you, you would like to do. In terms of proper, uh, per perception, you have this screen with the slides, but you can also take a personal copy the slides. We have the captions here for your perception, but also we're going to be recording this. So you can, if you miss something, you can always go to that recording, play it back, fast forward, rewind. And then in terms of interaction and action in this, in this learning space, this virtual learning space, you can use the, the question box. You can doodle on your, or in your desk. You can always send us an email if you have questions afterwards. So this is our third in our webinar series, um, and the first two have been recorded and they will be up, um, Amy has told us, for a month, so you'll be able to watch those for a month. The first one was around the UDL core concepts, kind of the thinking and the underpinning behind the, the UDL lens. The second was UDL in practice, where we went over our UDL design process and how to use that and how to use the guidelines. And then today, we'll be talking about UDL in a virtual environment, and then on Friday, May 15th, we'll be talking about UDL and CTE. So that's the progression. And as I said, those things are recorded and this one will also be recorded. So what we're going to talk about today is we're gonna do a quick review of UDL for those of you who weren't at our first and our second webinar. And we're going to help to prepare you to be able to use the UDL framework to design your syllabus for your virtual learning in ways that increase accessibility. And then the last goal is to be able to, for you to be able to design ways to support self-regulation in a virtual environment. So with that said, just take a minute and set your intention. We know our brains are goal-directed, and so if we set our intention about what we wanna get out of this webinar, then we'll be more likely to be able to pay attention to those things as they come up. So you can put your goal in the question box, or you can put your goal on a sticky, or you can just hold it in your mind, but just take a second to set that intention. Melissa, I just want to bring up with um, the organizers that I'm only able right now to respond and see the organizers and panelists' comments. So, Amy and um, Kirsten, I don't know if you could help me um, so that I can respond to folks. It just was so interactive the last two webinars, and I wanted to make sure that that was still possible. So, are you looking in the question section? It's not coming up for you, Amanda. Yeah, I think. Yes, now I can see everyone. Thank you so much. Okay. Sure. All right, so hopefully I give you a minute to, to decide what your goal is for this webinar. I'm gonna do a quick review of UDL. So we keep showing this definition of UDL at every webinar and we're hoping that every time you see it, you can dig in a little deeper, notice something new, um, think differently about it. But the, the definition, the working definition, we use at CAS for Universal Design for Learning. It's an approach to improve and optimize teaching and learning by all, by setting clear and rigorous goals, anticipating barriers to those goals, and proactively designing to minimize those barriers using our UDL guidelines. And so the underpinnings, as we, we call the core concepts, are when we talk about UDL, we focus our attention to the environment. Our lens turns to the environment. So when we think about what is not working for students, instead of thinking about individual students, we think about that environment and where is that barrier and how can we redesign the environment so that there, it can be open to all. So the barrier is in the environment, not the learner, is our first core concept. Our second core concept comes from neuroscience because we know every brain has a unique, a unique structure, just like fingerprints, that every brain is different. So variability is actually the norm. It's not, it's not, um, it's not the exception. So every brain is different, so we design so that these environments and these, these lesson plans are flexible enough so that all students can have access. And then our last core concept is that variability is predictable in, throughout learning and it can be designed for. And we talked in our first um, 
our first webinar about those UDL guidelines and the things that the researchers were thinking about when they built those guidelines and what are the domains and the, the organization around uh, what variability looks like in learning. And we've organized it in those three columns, the, um, the engagement column, when we think about our effective network and how do I engage in the learning, the representation column, when we think about our perception network and how do I perceive knowledge and then the strategic network and the action expressed in principle, how do I act upon my learning and show my understanding? And so we've talked about it in those three columns and we're gonna go um, into it a little bit more, thinking more along the rows as we go through this webinar. One thing I wanted to point out before I turn it over is that we do have this free digital book that is on um, CAST's website. And so you can either if you don't have time to jot down this URL, you could um, just search for Universal Design for Learning Theory and Practice and you should be able to find it. But all you have to do is make a little account and it's free for you to, to read that book online. And there's some UDL embedded ways that you can, uh, videos you can play and ways that you can get it to be read to you as well. So that's a, an option for deeper learning as you think about UDL. And now I am going to turn it over. Am I turning it over to Sam or to Amanda? I forget. Um, I think to um, me, Melissa. Yeah. All right. Go for it, Amanda. Um, so using UDL in the, to design for a virtual environment. So first of all, I want to say um, I'm sorry that I was a little late responding to some of you, but it's so great to have all of you back. I love the responses that I'm seeing, and I'm going to um, capitalize on those. So. One thing that we want to, um, we're going to really hit on today is uh, the syllabus. So Melissa, if you don't mind forwarding to the next slide. We are going to, uh, oh, one back, sorry. The why, yeah, that's great. Um, so what we're going to do is take a look at our syllabuses, syllabi, and um, talk about how we can make sure that students can access those. And we're going to talk about why it is so essential to have um, a, a strong accessible syllabus. And Sam is going to help us also make sure that um, we're integrating UDL into the syllabus. And, and one reason that that's really important is, you know, you don't get a second chance to make that first impression. That's what my mom used to always tell me. Uh, so overtly or covertly, our syllabus is really making a statement about our class um, and about who we are as teachers. And um, some things that came up in the chat, interesting, when we asked you about the transition to remote learning, some of the responses were there was a barrier to time management. Students really struggled with time management. Some teachers were doing frequent check-ins. Um, and then students struggled to access technology. And then one I really liked was uh, teachers were incorporating routines from the physical classroom. And the idea here with the syllabus is if we can design our syllabus as a strong roadmap, it can help us take care of the barriers, right? Remove those barriers like time management or at least help address time management, address technology. And then it can also help us design for more frequent check-ins and design for more classroom routines. So students can get that at the beginning and be more successful along the way. Um, Melissa, are there any um, ideas that came up in New Hampshire when you were working with students uh, teachers, sorry, when you were working with teachers about transitioning to remote learning, any barriers that came up? Um, yes, and I just want to mention before we get to that in the chat, I also noticed that more than one person said changing the times that things happened or changing work schedules also was a barrier. So that really, that really emphasizes the, those routines and trying to keep up those routines. Um, so there were barriers around how students interact with the technology versus how they might interact in person. So there were some students that um, didn't want to be seen on camera. So that was different to, that felt different to them than to being seen in the classroom. So there were some barriers around that. And then um, in terms of screen time, some of the younger, younger students in New Hampshire, there was too much screen time going on. So how do I, how do I help parents help students with things that are not screen time? And so, one of my colleagues likes to think of parents as the, the new co-teachers in this in this environment. Um, so those are just a couple that I can think of off the top of my head. Perfect, okay, so let's move forward to the next slide and then <clears throat> I'm gonna turn it over to Sam. 
Um, so it starts with the syllabus, right? The syllabus really is the outline of how the course is going to go. It's the key parts of the course. And I know syllabus can be, some people think of syllabus as a higher ed term, but um, even in career technical education, I know at the high school level, um, all, courses all courses have to have a course outline or a syllabus. So this is relevant to everyone. I just wanted to also touch on in career and technical education, we often include safety contracts, permission slips for photography or for um, uh, field trips in our syllabus. So the syllabus is not only a way to communicate with the student, but um, in, K in uh, high school, it's also a way to communicate with the parent. So can, you can make sure that the student's on the same page, the student has all the information they need, and then also a way to communicate with the parent. Um, and let's go to the next slide, Melissa. Ooh, I keep skip, skipping, sorry. Is okay. This slide one? Yeah, this is the last slide. I just wanted to say, I just want to reiterate that it's really important. Uh, we talked in one of the earlier webinar, webinars about uh, why it's important to design. Uh, you, we use UDL to design so we know the goal, right? We design for the goal because you need to know the destination. I'm definitely the person in the passenger seat who's always saying to my husband, where are we going? Which route are we taking? Like, why are we heading there? How long is it going to take? Like, I want to know all that stuff. Um, so the syllabus can really help, help students who might be like me and want to know um, where they're going and what the destination is. And it can help you design a route to that destination. And I'm going to be a little bit cheesy here, uh, but if you think about Siri as our analogy, um, in your syllabus, you want to have clear communication. So with Siri, she's very clear, turn left, turn right. She doesn't say, if you feel like it, turn left, right? And she also, you can turn up her volume, right? So it's very clear communication. Uh, the expectations with Siri, I expect that she's not going to steer me into traffic. I expect that she will take me the routes I need to go. The syllabus should set clear expectations. Um, support, Siri is uh, often offering me multiple routes to get to where I want to go. She'll ask if I want to pay tolls, if I want to go through a bridge. So she's giving me multiple choices along the way. And then lastly, <laughs> this one's a bit of a push, but I still actually really think it's it's useful. The syllabus helps set the climate and Siri doesn't judge me, right? If I miss a turn, she just says recalculating and we get back on the path, right? Not a lot of judgment. So I think it's really important to think about the syllabus being um, the route that you can take to get students to the destination, especially important in the virtual world. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Sam. Great, thank you, Amanda. And I just would add one one thing to that. I think the syllabus also in this time, you know, we're all having to, to think about restructuring how we do things. Um, and it also helps us sort of think about, you know, is what we're sort of putting in place realistic? And also think about it as, a, as an evolving um, document because it needs to be right now. So, you know, historically we think of it as something we said at the beginning of the, the you know year and we move ahead and yes people need consistency but i think there is also a way of looking at pieces and thinking about okay what's working what's not what could i sort of bring into the communication um to improve things or whatever we have to you know we have to be responsive now and kind of going back to the the siri analogy you know having a good syllabus and looking at your destination and thinking the ways you're going to get there it also lets you think about what's realistic or not right so um, that's a really important thing now to really have a roadmap so you can think about, well, realistically, you know, maybe before I was able to cover four hours of content with students in a day and skill development. And now really given everybody's circumstances, including my own, someone in here mentioned compassion. It's also compassion for ourselves, right? Um, what can I do? So, you know, that's why we're sort of focused on the syllabus because it is a chance to sort of revisit, set clear expectations, um, and think about them uh, grounded in the context that, that we're in now. Um, so when we really think about, you know, moving into virtual environments and your syllabus is going to be something that largely you're communicating digitally to people now, we want to really model accessibility. So accessibility is really the foundational layer of, of universal design for learning. If we don't address accessibility, and that really means that we uh, make things available in an equally effective, equally integrated uh, and timely manner for students um, with disabilities in the same way we would for students without. So we really make sure that accessibility is addressed from the, 
from the very start because if we don't have access, we can't then turn good access into meaningful learning. Um, so we want to model accessibility in our syllabus. And this um, cast has done quite a bit of work around taking the concepts, the sort of main tenets of uh, web accessibility um, and turning those into kind of, you know, common concepts. So the first, that this is what we like to say as we talk about pouring on the accessibility. And pour really means um, four things that we sort of apply to all communication and content that we create in the, in the digital world. So the first is really perceivable. And what that means is that is the information and is the approach to uh, operating something an environment is it perceivable um, does it can ev all your us users access that information um, in ways that they can perceive so if we didn't have captioning here today in this in the delivery of this format we would have people who were not using auditory processing to access this information unable to participate um, so we want to make sure that in both the materials we create and the delivery of those materials um, that we are ensuring that the, the information is perceivable by all, that everyone can have that chance to perceive the information in the ways that, um, that work for them. The next is we really want to think about operable. And what operable means is that the, the way the user interface, so how you interact with the digital environment, and the navigation, so the ways in which you move through and find, you know, okay, I'm going from this this site to this site or this page to this page, um, that those can be navigated by um, by all users. So one of the really important questions you want to ask is, let's say I'm not physically moving with a mouse, using a mouse, is there a keyboarding option? So say I had repetitive strain injury in my hand and moving things around was very difficult. Can I still access the information, right? Because you can imagine an activity like uh, asking someone to demonstrate that they understand uh, in a manufacturing course that they understand the supply chain and your question is drag and drop these parts of the supply chain in order well if that person can't drag and drop you're not getting any information about whether they understand the supply chain you're getting information about whether they can drag and drop which is probably i have a kindergartner probably a good skill for her to be able to have but if you have a high school student and you want them to demonstrate they understand manufacturing processes, you want to make sure you're you're not putting a barrier to them showing their understanding because they can't operate in the environment. So that matters for your syllabus and it matters for all the choices you make that are reflected in your syllabus about the technologies you choose to use, that they can be operated by people who, who um, manipulate the digital world differently. Um, understandable is really important and that matters so uh you know so much so often we'll have resources that we use in our syllabus or we'll link students out to other things so um a handful of years ago we ran an, a center on online learning and students with disabilities um, with partners at kansas university and we did a study to look at readability levels and we found that the main information actually was at an appropriate readability level for the grade four students that were using it, but all these link outs were two or three grade levels above. So doing things like getting, using plain language when you can, especially if you're communicating with parents and some of the materials, right? Using plain language, making sure that technology terms, terms like accessibility are translated and explained, right? That helps with understandable. If people don't understand, they can't do what you want them to do. Um, checking the readability level of things, those things really matter. And then the last one is robust. And I noticed a number of you mentioned, you know, limited access to technology. Robust really means that the things that you choose are strong enough that they can work on different technologies. So if you have two versions back of the browser that you're using because you've got an older computer, the, the cool site that you've picked for your class, you know, and built into your, your syllabus for, you know, week three of the course doesn't crash for this student and not for another. So you want to make sure that things are robust, that the technologies have been vetted and tested and the delivery of them tested so that they work for across um, across different technology environments. And then if someone's using assistive technology like screen reading technology, if someone 
um, is visually impaired and they're using a screen reader, that that functions well with the information, that that technology doesn't all of a sudden not be able to read the page or the, the learning management system or whatever that someone's in. So we're gonna talk about those things a bit. If you can go to the next slide. Um, and poor really relates to the access layer of UDL. So as I was saying, that's really the foundation. That's sort of, you know, if you build a house, you can't build a house without a good foundation. So if you don't address this issue of access, you know, how do you, you know, think about physical action? We talked about that. How do you think about if someone can't physically manipulate the information, can they get it um, through keyboarding alternatives? If they're using an assistive technology, does it function well with that? Um, is it is it easy to navigate, even if there's not a very specific need for an assistive technology? You know, are there so many steps to the to the you know to the choice I've made for a, a tool to something that it, people are turned off before they're even there? So you know, that's also important. So, you know, are there options for physical action? Can they really manipulate the environment well and navigate their way through? We've talked a lot about perceptions, a great example here today. You can listen or you can read the captions. Um, and, you know, the other area is really in terms of thinking about our syllabus and making sure everyone can access it. Uh, helps with accessibility, but it also helps with access in terms of engagement, right? If I come to your syllabus and I don't understand what's going on and I'm totally overwhelmed by what you've put in front of me, I'm not going to be motivated to participate in your class. So it really is your roadmap and it's your contract with students. Um, so if we look first at this idea of perceivable, can everyone see and hear the content? It's really every single, single technology you choose for your virtual learning environment, you should be able to answer that question with a yes. Um, so if you go to the next one, Lisa. Um, so we have a, a resource that we developed at CAST actually targeted to higher ed. Um, but it was built with higher education institutions. I'm sure there were some in Illinois um, that received Department of Labor tact funding. Um, this, this was funding to kind of build out workforce development programs in the community and technical college space. And most of those programs were blended. So they had some face-to-face -face components and they had some online. So we built this resource to help people think about, okay, as you're doing all the things you do to make online work, you're using different types of media, come to this site and you'll understand the UDL connection. So every single resource in here operates the same way. And then the, there's a call out box on the side around just purely around accessibility. So this resource here is under our medias and materials section of UDL on campus. And Amanda's put the link in the chat. It's udloncampus.cast.org. And this is a specific resource just about video. And video is a really powerful medium for conveying information and for connecting. I know my kids in their schools, the, the teachers and the administrators use video a lot just to be like, hi, I'm still here. <laughs> I, st I still exist and I miss you. And they can show things. You can show practices with video. You can show, you know, tool Amanda has a 3D printer in her basement. You know, you can show a process using it. Video is very, very powerful. But it will keep um, it will keep people out if we use it in ways that are not accessible. So we really want to think about using video in a way that um, includes captions, that includes transcripts, that includes audio descriptions if they're needed for describing the information that might be important, but that's not um, but that's not spoken. Um, so, you know, describing what's happening outside of what the person is saying, that the environment, the background, other things that are important. So you can use video and images in your syllabus. So, for example, a lot of people use video to introduce themselves at the top of their syllabus. You could have a little uh, link to a short captioned video of you introducing your course, talking about why it's exciting to you, what matters to you, what you hope people will get out of your course. It's sort of you know, actually really kind of a, a very, um, really uh, relationship affirming invitation in. And there's some great examples on places like edX um, of really good intro videos to some of those courses that you can take a look at. So it's a great way to introduce yourself. You can create a space where students can introduce themselves in your syllabus. You could have a little part of your syllabus that's, you know, links out to little links of students actually introducing themselves um, and really sort of focusing on that community aspect of learning that we so don't want to lose in this environment. 
You could introduce weekly activities with a little video, right? You could actually demonstrate a practice um, using video. Um, you can provide feedback via video. Again, it's a way of connecting. You could show someone rather than tell them what didn't, didn't go right. That's incredibly important for hands-on courses. You can link out to social media. And that also, we have some resources at CAST just about accessible social media. So if you're using Twitter or Facebook, Instagram, there's ways of making sure that you're using those environments in a way that's accessible, the videos and images you might put in. Those are also really important for people who may have limited access to technology. Some of you mentioned working with students in a, in a more rural setting who might have lower bandwidth. You can put your, or may have, uh, have data plans they don't wanna use up, right? They don't wanna have an expensive data plan or use all their data up. So you could have the, the text for a video, so the captions or the transcript or the text equivalent for an image show up instead of the actual uh, video or image, which takes longer to load and requires more bandwidth. So it's also really important for supporting everybody having access to the information. Um, so you've got an example here of alternative text. And what alternative text is, is really, if you can imagine not being able to see this image, this image is, is of um, the Brazil Mechatronics team at the World Skills Competition in 2009 in Calgary, Alberta. Um, and so and all text is basically, if I were not, if I didn't have access to that image, it's a text equivalent that describes what's actually in that image. So it describes the important information. Um, and that's a really nice thing to make your syllabus more than you know a really heavy text document. You're providing images, you're providing video around the way. It's really a living, breathing, um, walk through your course um, that students can really use to anchor themselves week by week and understand your activities and their deliverables. Feel free to add some other ideas to the chat. It's really important that you share with one another, not just with us. So um, maybe next slide, Melissa. Sam, so could I jump in yeah, really quick about video? Um, quite a few people were saying that they the transition, they did make some video series so that that's something that educators were finding useful. And I just wanted to reiterate, we did a webinar uh, for paras a while back and um, uh, the paras were saying that when teachers make videos, it's really useful because they can watch the videos as well and then offer students more of the support. And they were finding that students were maybe watching the videos multiple times. So I just wanted to really reiterate that for that transition, video has seemed to be a very uh, useful tool. And you know, please include in the chat if you've also found that. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And students can slow things down, right? I mean, my I have a, a five-year-old and she watches her teacher's, it's called Foundations Lesson Every Day, her kind of spe you know, spelling uh, lesson, they spell out words and whatever. And so the teacher makes this video, she can slow it down to the pace that works for her. But the other thing that's amazing is I can upload videos to her, she has a range of teachers, to her teachers so they can see what I might be doing right or not doing right. So it's really powerful both ways too. And if parents are able to, you know, um, make sure that they can use video effectively and think about captioning and, and things like that properly, that can even help with, you know, maybe if someone's a, not an uh, English isn't their first language, it can help with making sure there's full understanding. Um, a teacher reviewing a video that a a family member had put in could be great for them, um, you know, to access. Well, they've got a room full of noisy kids and they can look at the captioning, but they can't listen to it. So it just, you know, making sure that those videos are accessible and captioned and transcribed is really um, useful. And, and we have resources and we've run a number of webinars just around making sure to use video in a, you know, in a way that, that helps enhance the learning environment now. And the last question, Sam, was how long should alt text be? Should it describe everything or just give enough to describe it in general? It's a great question. And we'll put in the chat also the aim. We have a four part, our, our national, we run a national center on accessible educational materials at CAST. And we have a, a short, a bunch of short webinars just on poor um, and, and one specifically around image descriptions. So the rule is alt text should be short. It should really be, um, you know, give you the broad brush strokes of what you're seeing. Um, 
if you need something longer called an image description, um, that's the kind of thing that ideally actually you'd have in the text. So you wouldn't, you would, you would, you know, if you used an image and it was really something you were using for instruction, your text would be naturally in the, you know, you would have text there so people had that option automatically. Um, but there is a lot of information on resources about when to um, when to decide whether it's alt text or an image description. You always should start with the big idea and then get into more specific details. Um, and we have some resources on CAST uh, about you know good good image descriptions. And then the other place to look is the Diagram Center, and they offer a whole decision tree about you know here's an example of an image. Should it just be alt text or a long description and we can um, we can provide some more detail about that as well um, but all text really should should not generally be long um, it should just give you the big big idea if you need an image description uh, it usually means that you know there's far more detail to the image that's really required for people to be able to understand it you know be assessed on what's the, that content is and um, yeah and that that um, I'm going to share the Yale on campus link, Sam, with them about the alt text. So great. Okay, great. Good. So that's so perceivable is a really big bucket of things and very important. And um, and we've got a lot of sort of additional resources there. But I think it's, you know, the first thing to think about in your syllabus is if you're doing things like adding um, images or video, you know, thinking about captioning, transcribing and creating image alt text or if you need them image descriptions really goes a long, long way to making sure that all your students can access your syllabus and your materials operable is really you know can everyone navigate the information with ease um, so if we think about you know can everyone navigate that so if you go on um, Melissa um, the next slide uh, a really important thing is to use, so if you're using Microsoft Word or PowerPoint or these technologies, is to actually use the embedded, you know, people often like to get really creative and do their own things, but what you want to do is you want to use the styles that are already there um, because they create, essentially they indicate to someone who is accessing that information, for example, using a screen reader, but even anybody who needs support around executive functioning an organization, they create an order to the information and a structure for it. So, you know, if you go up to the top bar in Microsoft Word or, you know, um, PowerPoint, um, you can choose, okay, first let, let me choose that this is a title and then this is a heading one for, you know, my main level information. Here's the textbook, you know, heading two, here's the core, uh, you know, here's the name of the textbook. Uh, and then, so it basically creates an order for you, uh, a, hierarchy, a hierarchy of the information. And what's really important is that it creates an outline for the students. So it's basically, it will create automatically for you a table of contents. But what that does is it lets people know, especially, you know, you think about people have limited time and resources and a lot going on now. It lets them know where to pay the most attention. Okay, I know this is this level of information, so I need to give it this much attention. And you know, when I come back to this and have more time, I'll, I'll dig into the details, right? You want your assignments to, to have a header um, so people know to pay attention. So really using the styles headers um, appropriately. And then the other thing that's really important is descriptive links. So putting click here is not very helpful for somebody who doesn't know the context around click here, right? Um, what you want to do is you want to put and putting a raw URL is really ineffective because somebody, you know, who's using a screen reader just reads, you know, HTTP forward slash forward slash colon uh, 4765. It's really terrible. So what you want to do is you want to put a descriptive link. So you want to put something like, um, you know, uh, Foundations of Chemistry as your link. OER alternative to Foundations of Chemistry if you have an open education resource that people can access instead of the textbook. So you want those links to tell the person what they're going to be linking off into so they can decide to skip it, they can decide to go. 
um, and really conserving people's time, getting them information in an organized way, this is very helpful for that in, in terms of making sure that their time is focused on what you want them to be focusing on, not trying to figure out where they are and what things mean and how they get from A to B. Could you flip on to the next one, Melissa? So we've talked a little bit about some questions, but thinking about, um, should I turn it over to Amanda or Melissa for this part, reflect, resonate? Yeah, I, um, Amanda, when, will... you, when you think about CTE, what, do you, what is resonating for you in this? Um, yes, so one thing that I think is interesting um, is, so you all have gotten to know me during this webinar series. Um, so my husband teaches, teaches manufacturing and woodshop. And as I said before, he's creating these videos to um, engage with students. He, I did teach him how to do captioning, so that was really critical. And actually, he heard from a lot of students that captioning was really useful um, at, uh, during this time because they were home with their, you know, siblings or their parents, and the TV was going on, and you know, it was really nice to have the words as well as the sound. So I think that was a really useful. Uh, useful find for him. Um, the other thing is some folks did ask how long should videos be? I just want to kind of address this one out like with everyone. Um, and you know, you'll find everything from six to nine minutes, but I'm going to really encourage everyone to think about trying to make their videos four minutes or less. So think of it as the average length of a trailer in a movie theater. Um, when you sit down, you know, sometimes I watch the trailers, I think I saw the whole movie, right? So you can really squeeze a lot into three to four minutes, but um, longer than that, I think we do start to lose students. Um, and the last thing I want to say about video is make sure that you watch the videos you assign students. I, I don't think this has to be said, but um, I was finding that my own son was getting assigned a lot of videos and I'm not sure if the teacher was watching all of them or if there was, there was never a handout to go with them. So just encouraging us to use video thoughtfully. And I'm going to share a link in, uh, from the AIM Center on the 10 tips for creating quality video. Yeah, I might also add that the benefit of videos, and you can give this, um, this, these ideas to your students, but students can, um, if they're on YouTube, if they're housed on YouTube, even on an unlisted or private channel, students can open a transcript and then they can read all, if it's closed captioned, they can read all the closed captions, they can watch it at half speed, as Sam was talking about um, how her daughter does, or they can watch, they can speed it up, and you can give the students all those tricks to say, you know, if you if you find your attention waning, maybe you want to speed it up a little bit, that sort of thing. Yeah, that's perfect. But we would love to hear from you um, what's resonating so far. Um, if you, you know, this is a little bit of a formative check-in. So if you could let us know what's um, resonating, if you have any questions, how might this work in your context? You know, we still have time in the webinar to make some adjustments and we can also address them if you have CTE specific questions in the final fourth webinar. So. Maybe we keep going, Melissa? Uh, yeah, understandable. Um, Sam, I think I was going to take the next three. Okay, great. So um, it's really important that our syllabus is understandable, but that's part of poor. So if we want to create access, we need to make sure that everyone understands what we're what we're talking about. And we might think people understand, and um, and maybe they don't. And I know we have a, uh, we have had in the past a lot of English uh, language learner teachers on, so I think this is very relevant um, to uh, to that population as well. Um, maybe go to the next slide, and we'll keep going. So we did talk before about um, the importance of choice. And when we think about assessments, we saw this uh, this cartoon, which said, you know, for, to be fair, basically everyone has to take the same exam. Um, Sam and I presented this a little while ago and she said, oh yeah, the fish is definitely gonna win climbing that tree. <laughs> and I thought that was you know, a great way to point out, you know, if we give everyone the same assessment, there will be some, folks who are um, going to find it easier than others. So um, we want to make sure we have choice. Choice builds uh, agency, um, as you can see here, and that can lead us to expert learning. So we were hoping that you could think about how each of your students could connect with you virtually. So what's a way that we can give to people choice to connect with us to make sure that we understand or that they understand what we're asking them? And I did, there was a teacher or an educator who was here sharing that um, 
one of the biggest things she's done is continually ask, how, is it, how are you going? Is it working? Is this working for you? And I think, I think that's really critical to ensuring understanding. And we'll just go to the next one, Melissa, so I can- Wait, Amanda, can I just add, just because there's oh, a course. really good question in here about one of the bearers trying to incorporate some of our classroom routines into our virtual classroom. Students have had technical difficulties with logging in, staying connected, hearing clearly. That's also where choice is so, so important, right? So if you, for example, yes, the best practice is for people to be able to show up in this, these types of web meetings and be able to show up and also be on camera, but not, not everybody can do that, right? Um, they may have low bandwidth, there might be chaos in the background, they don't wanna share, whatever. So building in things that allow for choice, um, like we, you know, this work comes from the work out of, um, deaf tech uh but always having people announce their name before they speak so if you've got a big group and before i say something i say okay sam speaking here blah blah blah. i've given people a choice to still participate even though you know they don't have to be on camera they don't have to look at everybody else on camera to participate so a lot of those things around choice are very important for motivation but they really are important for also understanding that different people are going to have different types of access to technology right i might be able to type things in but i can't necessarily raise my hand and unmute because i've got two kids yelling in the background or whatever so it really helps with the context people are in right now too not just um just motivation but actually really enabling them to participate yeah, great. Thank you, Sam. So the one thing that we really wanted to um, encourage you to do is to think about, and I'm sure all of you do this, you make a statement about yourself, or as Sam said, you create a video about who you are as an educator. Really think about maybe um, a small takeaway from this webinar, you know, because we don't, you don't need to make all these changes at once, right? And that would not be successful, but a small takeaway could even be to let your, um, you know, students know that you are uh, very aware of universal design for learning and that you really want to know how you can help them access the material um, i think about i had a teacher who i worked with who would get to know their students at the beginning of every class um, and they he would say to the students what do you wish that your teacher knew about you and then the students would fill this out and then he really got great insights into the students and it allowed him to design his class with choice and to reach reach more of the students. So we just wanna encourage you to think about your syllabus as a way to set the climate, which we talked about already, and introduce yourself as an educator, your philosophy, your approach, and your focus on UDL and designing universally. And now, um, uh, uh, back to you, Sam. <laughs> Great. So I think we've we've talked about this a lot, and I, I don't need to to spend much time on it. But I think it's great in your syllabus if you can communicate choice in a number of ways. So um, this resource on UDL on campus that we're sharing here is one on web conferencing. We've actually updated it with some things around you know where the accessibility features are and tools like Zoom and Adobe Connect, um, which is good to know, as well as some of the security and privacy stuff that's been really important to people here. But you know, it's important with web conferencing to think about how do I make sure that everybody who's in these types of environments like we're in now can access them in ways where they can perceive the information, assuming not everyone's the same. Um, so that's one of the other resources on UDL on campus that could be helpful. But you do want to try, if you can, to offer more than one way to reach you, right? If showing up to your live meeting each week is the only way to get in touch with you and someone can't make that, for three weeks in a row, um, you may you may lose that student. Um, so you know, offering more than one way to get in touch with you. Some people create Slack channels. Um, some people, um, you know, offer a range of office hours and then email or whatever. But just providing some choice. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really important to not just tell people to use a technology, but to provide a demonstration or offer a demonstration of how to use it. That's where you'll understand things like whether it's operable or not for someone, whether the interface is understandable, right? And especially for those of you working in K-12 and working with parents too, um, they may be 
as a their understanding of the technology may be as a, an, as essential as that of the the students you're working with. Um, so really being willing to create a way of demonstrating how a technology is used, even something you're asking people to link out to, go use this, you know, extra thing, making sure that you're not just telling them to use something, but giving them a choice and an option to come and um, use it, get get instruction on how to use it. Um, and when you use accessibility practices and the technologies you choose, you are creating choice. So when you create a video and you caption and transcribe, right there, you've created a choice. When you uh, provide an image description, you've created a choice, right? I can look at the text, I can look at the image. I'm actually someone, I don't process images very well. I don't, I, my visual spatial skills are not fabulous. So I always, if I take a course like statistics or economics or something like that, I always, always have to read the text equivalent in order to understand the visual information. Even though I can see it, I can't process it without the text. So choice, um, communicating choice, offering a lot of choice in your syllabus is really important for making sure people can engage. Um, next slide, Lisa. So I'll pass it back to you, Melissa, I think. Um, so I'll just, uh, we're getting, we got about 10 minutes left, so I wanna make sure we can get through everything. But some of the things that are coming in through the chat, someone is asking about podcasts, if we have any, any, um, ideas for podcasts. I do want to say that uh, really resonates with me about if you're making a video and doing captioning that you've created a choice and I've never thought about it that way and I really like that. Um, similarly, when we make slide decks and we write in the speaker notes, you can read the speaker notes or you can listen to the speaker. So that that was interesting. Um, and I, I'll just ask you guys if either of you have um, ideas for podcasts, but before I do that, I want to point folks to the handouts because there was one question about, do you have a, do you have an example of a UDL syllabus? And that handout, I believe, will be really useful to people. So if you go to the handout section and download that past UDL syllabus for ICSPS, that would be helpful to you, I think. Yeah, and, and let me just say that, that, sorry, just that syllabus is one we used as the syllabus for a, a, a pre-conference we did where we we sort of talked about accessibility and UDL, but it's a that model of the syllabus, you can take that model and apply it to course, apply it to something else. But it was it was basically the model, the syllabus was for a four hour pre-conference pre at a conference. So just so you know what's in there. Okay. Um, Sam, someone did ask if there's a, a reader, like a, a tool that they can use to check to see if how uh, accessible their syllabus is or to, to check on the way an e-reader might, you know, read their syllabus is do we? I don't know if we have any. If the AIM Center has a tool like that, so it's a very good question. So um, one thing that I is not that easy to do is to um, actually take a Word document and transfer it to PDF and then check the accessibility. You actually need some skills to be able to do that. So we do have information on the AIM. Uh, website about you know checking the accessibility of all things but what I would encourage you to do is create your syllabus in Microsoft Word use the templates the headers the whatever and then you just go to review and you could go to check accessibility and it'll walk you through every thing that um, you need to fix if you need to fix stuff so if you did if you put a bunch of images in your syllabus and you didn't create an alt tag um, you know, alternative text for it, it'll pop that up as, you know, it'll do an accessibility check and it'll tell you, hey, you've got these 10 issues on, you know, here, 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 and here. And it'll walk you through them one by one and give you a strategy for how to go about fixing them. So years ago, this stuff used to be really hard. You do an accessibility check and you have no clue what to do about it. Now you do an accessibility check and it walks you through all the things um, one by one. In, it points you to the exact spot and it walks you through why you should fix it and what you need to do to fix it. I'd also encourage you to um, look at our, our AIM resources around um, you know, how to address accessibility and how to check, check for it. But in any of the Microsoft tools, you can do an accessibility check. So PowerPoint, uh, Microsoft, Excel, all of those, you can, you can run a, an accessibility checker just under the review um, tab. Oops, I went too fast. This is back to you, I think, Sam. 
Great. So we talked about this a little bit, but I think this is really important. And I think for those of you who are at institutions where you're, you're, um, you know, you have a central person and, and, and you know, your director of ed technology, your tech procurement person, be asking them these questions about the technology. Um, so, you know, if I use this resource, is it going to work um, on, you know, for someone who has two versions back of Internet Explorer? If I use this, um, you know, technology, is it going to look as good on a phone as it's going to look on a desktop? Because I know that, you know, my students only, you know, have a phone and a tablet at home. They don't have a computer. Um, so asking some of those questions to know that the that the technology is robust enough that it's going to work across a range of settings, um, you know, those are really important questions to be asking of whoever's the gatekeeper for the technology or whoever's uh, or the the technology itself. If you're pulling from off the shelf, um, you want to make sure that it's it's robust enough that it functions across settings and it takes into account context. So we talked about these a lot. I think we can move on. I'll just pass it back to um, Melissa. I think it's, yeah. So I'm gonna pass it back to you here in terms of, oh, um, yeah. So just one more resource we wanted to talk about on UDL on campus. And this is really thinking about this issue of self-regulation, which is so important in these settings um, and executive functioning. So that's really needing to be addressed in new structures for teaching and learning. So doing things in your syllabus like as Amanda mentioned, sort of mentioning that, um, you know, I'm gonna think about what you need here and I'm not gonna expect you all to be the same. Here's my UDL statement or my teaching philosophy. That goes a lot, a long way to help people think about, okay, I can, I can show up here. I'm not gonna just be stressed out about um, this experience because someone's given me a structure and order. They recognize that, you know, I'm a unique person showing up here. Um, and that they're going to account for the fact that we don't all engage with this environment in the same same way. So I think sort of thinking about supporting executive functioning in online environments, we have some resources around that. We have some resources around support supporting self-regulation. Um, those are really important things to do in these settings. I mean, Amanda's uh, husband does a video uh, with his class and he starts with breathing. You know, it seems like silly stuff, but all that stuff is really important right now for helping people in this time that really um, is hard for everybody. And then one other thing in terms of supporting self-regulation, and we talked about this a lot in terms of video, but what are some things you could think about building into your course and, you know, building into your syllabus to make problem solving and thinking really clear to people and visible? So visible to you as the teacher, but maybe visible to everybody, because that's the stuff I bet a lot of you feel you're missing in these virtual environments. So we um, borrowed this a little bit, this idea from the Playful Assessment uh, Lab at MIT, but they have something called the Beyond Rubrics Toolkit, and they think about how to make learning processes visible, and they have a cool thing called the Stuck Station, and that's really a way of sort of video recording um, they use it in a physical classroom, but it's a way of, of video, video recording your learning as it's happening, where you got stuck, how you troubleshooted, who helped you out, your frustration. So making that stuff really normal in the virtual space, you know, maybe having people put videos up of their outtakes, you know, what I was trying to build something, here's where it went wrong, here's where it didn't. You could have a low tech alternative too, right? You could create a thread in your discussion board or have students send you something at the end of the week saying, you know, here are all the places I, you know, got stuck and making the the parts of learning that aren't just about performing or achieving really common and normal in your classroom is really, really important because that's what you, as a teacher, that's what you engage with people um, in day in and day out in the classroom and bringing that back and making that visible is really important for people learning how to, you know, remembering that learning is really about learning how to learn not about just, you know, the content or skill you can demonstrate. Great, thank you so much, Sam, for all of those ideas. And um, so we talked about our syllabus when we were talking about our UDL guidelines, we're going by the rows, access, build, internalize. And then just bringing it back a little bit back to our, um, to our networks, we wanna, in our syllabus, provide multiple means of engagement. And we talked about making those 
goals really salient and uh, heightening those goals and objectives for each of those those units and making sure that content is relevant to your students and as we've said over and over op opportunities for choice within the course and then when we think about how our students are perceiving we want to be explicit about the ways in which students can access the content make sure to give them those tips you can slow this down you can speed this up you can look at the you can look at the speaker notes to help them to to internalize that content and turn it into you know, useful information and then always think about the ways that students can demonstrate their knowledge to you in multiple ways how can they communicate to you what they're doing where they're getting stuck um, what's working for them and not working for them but with all of these ideas we want you to remember that it's we like to use the phrase udl plus one and amanda sort of pointed to this a little bit earlier but don't don't overwhelm yourself with trying to add everything at once this is an iterative process you plan you try things out you implement a new strategy you reflect on what worked for folks and what didn't work and you can use some of those those um, reflections from your students in that and then you plan again because udl is not a checklist you use udl based on your goal and then you help you you walk them through these processes and these choices so you can help them learn how to learn and not just what to learn because udl varies in every context so as we say small changes make a big difference and we're right at time, so what I'm gonna say is our um, email addresses, if you could throw those in the chat really quick, Amanda, if anybody has any additional questions. And um, then I think one last thing is, this is um, our CAS Customized Professional Learning contact, Maddie, so if you have anything that you wanna be customized for your, um, for your, your group or your school or your district, uh, you can contact Maddie and she can help you out with that. But as we're at 301, I want to say thank you, and I'll let my co-presenters say thank you. Thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm, I'm still plowing through a few of the questions in the chat. I think some have been answered, but please feel free to reach out to any of us, um, and we're happy to answer any questions. And thanks so much for the time today and for all you're doing to adjust in these uh, very challenging times. Absolutely. Um, so I want to thank you. Oh. Sorry. Amy, someone did have a question about how they can access the recorded um, webinar, so you might just want to address that too. Absolutely. So first, thank you all so much. This has been fantastic content and much needed um, as we are not going to be flipping right side up anytime soon, as you all did mention. Um, for those of you in attending, again, we do have another webinar on Friday. That is our last, our part four of our four-part series. And then 24 hours from now, you will be receiving a generated email from the system. It will have the link to um, the ICSPS website, and you can go on there and search for UDL, and you'll find the recordings as well. You'll have that link. And then there's also an evaluation. So we're really looking at ways we can work with CAS as we move into FY 2021. And I really encourage you to fill out those evaluations, tell us what you liked, tell us what you'd like to see more of, and we will um, be responsive to that in the upcoming fall and winter months through next year. So with that, thank you, Melissa, Sam, and Amanda so much. This content has been fantastic. And I will happily share your emails with um, the attendees so they can direct questions to you if that's okay or that's yeah, great. That work for you guys. All right, I see nodding heads. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful day. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll Hopefully see you all on Friday. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.